Hare Krishna. So this morning we're reading from Canto number 9, chapter number 6, entitled The Downfall of Sobri Muni. Today we're reading from text number 49. Sagada Chetu Pashina Atma Parnavamatmanaha Dadarsha Bhavracharyo Translation and purport by His Divine Grace, Shri A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami, Srila Prabhupada Ki. Thereafter, one day, while Sobri Muni, who was expert in chanting mantras, was sitting in a secluded place, he thought to himself about the cause of his fall down, which was simply that he had associated himself with the sexual affairs of the fish. Purport. Vishwanath Chakravati Thakur remarks that Sobering Muni had fallen from his austerity because of a Vaishnav Aparad. The history is that when Garuda wanted to eat fish, Sobering Muni unnecessarily gave the fish shelter under his care. Because Garuda's plans for eating were disappointed, Sobri Muni certainly committed a great offence to a Vaishnav. Because of this Vaishnava Parad, an offence at the lotus feet of a Vaishnav, Sobri Muni fell from his exalted position of mystic tapasya. One should not, therefore, impede the activities of a Vaishnav. This is the lesson we must learn from this incident concerning Sobari Muni. Shila Prabhupada Ki. Om Ajnana Timirandhasya Jnananjana Shalakaya Chakshur Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Mano Bhishtam Sapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Swapanantikam Vandeham Shri Guru Shri Rakta Kamalam Shri Guru Vaishnavam Shri Dupam Sagrajatam Sahagana Raghunathan Vitam Tam Sajivam Sadvaitam Savadutam Vrijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishakan Vitam E Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namastute Tapta Kanchana Gaurangi Radhe Vrinda Ganeshwari Vrishabhanu Sute Devi Pranama Mihari Priye Vancha Kalpataru Pyascha Kripa Sindhu Evacha Patitanam Bhaganebhyo Vaishnavebhyo Namo Namaha Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhara Shri Vasudhi Gaura Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare So with the permission of the Vaishnavas, I uh, I'll try to share something on this verse. One Srila Prabhupada, <coughs> he sent Mukunda Maharaj to the bank and he told him to bank some money. So Mukunda Maharaj went, this was in London, Mukunda Maharaj went to the bank, he did the job, everything, he came back. Srila Prabhupada said to him, did you bank the money? He said, yeah, I, I did it. Srila Prabhupada said, where's the receipt? So he said, receipt? No. Srila Prabhupada said, the bank teller didn't give you a receipt? He said, no, there was no receipt. Prabhupada paused. He looked at Mukunda Maharaj and he said, this signifies the end of the British Empire. 
<laughs> like, strange, right? Like, the bank teller didn't give you a receipt. Prabhupada said, this signifies the end of the British Empire. Because Srila Prabhupada, he was making the point that the England, the English, the British, they were able to rule so many parts of the world because they were organization and intelligence. They were very strict in how they organized everything. But now, because they had failed to give a receipt at the bank, it showed that their uh, bureaucracy was becoming compromised and therefore it signified the end of the British Empire. This story is interesting because it shows how someone who is very advanced can see the link between a cause and an effect. We can only see the link between a cause and effect when it's immediate. You do something and something immediately happens, therefore we realize, oh, this was the cause, this was the effect. As the distance starts getting more and more, the unintelligent person can't see the connection. But the very, very elevated person, they can see cause and effect happening over a long, long period of time. Therefore, in the world today, the biggest question against God is why do bad things happen to good people? Which basically means, why do bad things happen to me? Because I'm a good person. Because people cannot see there is cause and effect. They are only looking at the immediate, but they cannot see that there is a much bigger picture going on. And therefore, people get confused. We get confused in our own life, why things are happening. And also, we become complacent because we can't see cause and effect. Oh Prabhu, I went to the cinema and I wasn't even affected by it. Okay, let's wait and see, because cause and effect don't happen immediately. The seed goes in one place and the effect comes out maybe somewhere else. Here, the Acharyas are telling us there is again cause and effect. So Bariboni, a tapasvi, a great yogi, someone who was meditating underwater in seclusion, in such strict determination and discipline for so many years and he just saw two fishes copulating and that caused his fall down? This doesn't seem logical. This doesn't seem like it can be true. How can such a small thing trigger such a big fall down? But Vishwanath Chakravati Thakur who has the unlimited vision tells us that there's more to the story that we don't see. There was a cause many, many years before that now the effect was coming out. The fishes copulating and that sight was just the remote cause, uh, just the immediate cause of Sobri Muni's fall down. But there was also a remote cause, a deeper cause, a previous cause. And that previous cause was that Sobari Muni had created an offense. When we create a Vaishnava Aparad, all our weaknesses become magnified. If you have lust and then you commit a Vaishnava Aparad, it magnifies. If you have um, anger issues and you Commit a Vaishnava Aparad, it magnifies. Vaishnava Aparad magnifies all of your weaknesses. And therefore, Vishwanath Chakravati Thakur is explaining that Sobri Muni, he fell down, not just because he saw two fishes copulating, but because he had committed an Aparad. What had happened years ago is that Garuda was traveling over in different places, and as birds do, he was looking for snakes and fishes to eat. So one time Garuda went to Nagalaya. Nagalaya is the place where there are so many snakes. So he went there and he was eating so many snakes. And then at one point Vasuki, who was the leader of the snakes, was complaining that how is Garuda eating so many snakes here? So therefore Vasuki then went to Brahma 
and said, Brahma, you please create some kind of agreement here. This is like too much. Garuda is just eating all the snakes whimsically. So Brahma, Garuda and Vasuki made a deal. And the deal was that or, uh, Vasuki would arrange for one snake to be made available every half moon day. And this would be the offering to Garuda. And that way Garuda would be satisfied, the snakes would be somewhat protected and everyone would be happy. Win-win. So then it happened. It was going on. But there was one snake who had an issue with it. And one snake who said, why should we uh, honor Garuda in this way? And that snake was Kaliya. Kaliya said, I don't care for Garuda. And therefore Kaliya just started to eat those offerings that were meant for Garuda. When Garuda found out, then Garuda came, confronted Kaliya and said, how you dare to take my offerings? Then Garuda and Kaliya entered into a duel, a battle, and it became so intense. Kaliya was about to lose, but then Kaliya remembered one thing. Kaliya remembered there's one place I can go for protection. There's one place I can go that will be a sanctuary because there's one place that I can go where Garuda cannot go. And that was a lake in the Yamuna River. So Kaliya went to that place. It became later known as Kaliya Radha in the Yamuna River. And why could Kaliya go there but Garuda couldn't? Because previously what had happened is just like Garuda had gone to Nagalaya to eat serpents, Garuda was also coming to the Yamuna to eat fish. And in that Yamuna, Sobari Muni was doing his tapasya. And when Sobari Muni saw that Garuda was uh, um, eating the fish there, then Sobari Muni cursed Garuda that you cannot come to this lake. And therefore, because he had cursed Garuda, therefore Garuda could not come there. And therefore Kaliya took shelter there. And then later on we know that Kaliya poisoned the entire Yamuna. And uh, Krishna had to jump into the Yamuna. So you can go to that place in Vrindavan today where Kaliya was, uh, where Krishna was dancing on the hoods of Kaliya. Isn't it? You can see the tree where Krishna jumped out into the Yamuna and then after Krishna defeated and chastised Kaliya then Krishna jumped back onto the shore and then he went onto the hill isn't it the hill that Madan Mohan temple is now built on and that hill interestingly is known as Vadasa Ditya Deel the hill of seven, 12 sons and why is it known as the hill of 12 sons because when Krishna came out of the Yamuna after chastising Kaliya, then Krishna was shivering. And because Krishna was shivering and he was lying on that hill, then the one sun turned into twelve suns to heat up Krishna's body. Therefore, even today when pilgrims go to Vrindavan, then the first place they visit is Madan Mohan temple and the Dwada Saditya Teel. There's two reasons why when you enter Vrindavan, you should go there first. The first is because there Madan Mohan is situated. And Madan Mohan is the form of Krishna that helps you overcome lust. So before we start a yatra, then we are playing, praying to Krishna that let me overcome my lust, my selfishness, my... Um, self-centered mentality so that in this time I can actually do bhajan and the other reason the pilgrims go there is because just as the one sun turned into 12 suns and the intensity became 12 times more to heat Krishna's body the pilgrim is praying that while I'm here in Vrindavan let my bhajan let my spiritual practice become 12 times more intense so that is a very, very famous place. So here we're seeing that Sobri Muni fell because he became insensitive, inattentive in his dealing with a Vaishnava. 
As soon as we become inattentive and we become insensitive to the Vaishnavas, then we can understand that trouble is coming. There are many, many different ways in which Maya can bewilder a devotee. One time a devotee had left the movement, so they were, they were gathering and Srila Prabhupada was there. And Srila Prabhupada asked, where did this devotee go? So one devotee shouted, he said, Prabhupada, he left. So Prabhupada was very disappointed when any devotee left. So everyone could see that Prabhupada was somewhat affected by that. And then one devotee said, Anyway, Srila Prabhupada, once he has been uh, kicked about by the material nature enough, hit about by Maya, then he will come back. And then Srila Prabhupada said, just as there are no limit to the varieties of enjoyment in the spiritual world, similarly there are no varieties to the way in which Maya can trap you and bewilder you in the material world. So Maya has unlimited tricks to bewilder the conditioned soul. And the Bhagavatam is basically teaching us how to become aware of the tricks of Maya, how to become aware of all the mistakes that someone can make on their spiritual journey. Because if you look at the Bhagavatam, basically one way to look at it is the Bhagavatam is a book of mistakes. In the first canto, Parikshit makes a mistake because he mistreats Shamik Rishi. In the second canto, Brahmaji makes a mistake because he runs after his own daughter, Vak. In the fourth canto, Dhruva makes a mistake because he covets material things while worshipping the Lord. In the fifth canto, Bhara makes a mistake because he's on the level of Bhav, but then he gets attached to a Diya. In the sixth canto, Ajamiyo makes a mistake because He's doing good. He's from a cultured Brahmana family, but he just sees the wrong thing and immediately he becomes bewildered. So if you look at the Bhagavatam, every single canto is a canto in which we're learning how different devotees can make mistakes. Because Maya uh, has many tricks that can divert us from the spiritual path. Here there are specific tricks that Sobari Muni fell to, the tricks of Maya. The first trick that Sobari Muni fell to is the trick of Maya known as complacency. Because Maya usually never um, attacks a devotee in a very obvious way. Generally, Maya attacks a devotee in a very inconspicuous way. In English they say, in like a needle, out like a plow. So Maya, when she enters, generally she does not enter in a very obvious way. And therefore the complacent devotee doesn't see that Maya is entering, isn't it? When Putana came into Vrindavan, she did not come in a ghastly form where everyone could see, oh my God, there's a demon coming. No, no, she came in a very nice form, a very beautiful form, a very innocent form, a very unsuspecting form. But then what did she want to do? Kill Krishna. So the first thing to realize is that when Maya comes into your life, Maya will not come in a very obvious way. Maya will come in a very inconspicuous way. And therefore the first trick of Maya is Maya makes us complacent. Sobri Muni was complacent. It didn't seem like a big thing, like, okay, there are two fish copulating. Quick, close your eyes, look away. No, it was two fish, that's not going to do it, but it had an effect because it went in and it was coupled with other things that then bewildered him. So therefore, be very, very careful. Maya will come in in a way in which you have no idea um, this is a trick of Maya. Another trick of Maya is isolation. <clears throat> One sure way to know that you're heading for trouble is if you become isolated in your spiritual life. 
The moment someone is moving away from the association of the Vaishnavas, the moment one is in the community of Vaishnavas but doesn't really have good relationships and is almost lonely in the crowd, then you can immediately understand that problems are about to come. Because Srila Prabhupada always used to give the example of Aesop's fable, that if a stick is by itself, you can break it. But if a stick in is a bundle, you, you can't break it. So if we become isolated from other Vaishnavas, oh no, I can't relate to them, we're different, I always get into problems, and we isolate ourselves, then it can become very, very dangerous. So Sobri Muni, he was fixed up. He was very, very determined, but he was underwater all alone. The lesson for us is yogis in the past may have been able to do it in seclusion. We cannot do it in seclusion. It's not possible. Therefore, uh, Nirjan Bhajan is not for Kali Yuga. We do Sankirtan, uh, everything in Sangha. So another trick of Maya is isolation. But then another trick of Maya that Sobri Muni fell to was the trick of insensitivity. Maya makes you inattentive and insensitive towards others. You may not see that you're being insensitive to someone, but Krishna sees. Because Krishna says, Sadhavo ridayam mayam rasadunam ridayam taham you may say something, you may do something and you may not see on the face of the Vaishnav what that does to their heart because you're not in their heart you don't know how it's affected a Vaishnav but Krishna is in the heart Sadhavo Ridayam Mayam I'm in the heart of my devotee and therefore if a devotee is offended Krishna knows, and Krishna cannot tolerate that. Therefore, uh, Sobri Muni was insensitive to Garuda. An agreement was made. It was the nature of Garuda. He should not have questioned. Garuda is a great devotee. And Garuda, that is what birds do. They eat fish. That is their uh, livelihood. So Sobri Muni should not have obstructed that. But he did, he became insensitive, he thought he knew better and therefore later on he suffered because of it. So of course here the main lesson that Srila Prabhupada says we must learn from this incident is that one should never be offensive to Vaishnavas. We're hearing this all the time. <coughs> Why do you think in the Bhagavatam is constantly so many stories about the effects of offences? It's very interesting that all of these offences are there. There's so many ways in which you can create offence. There's like intentional offence, that you do something intentionally to hurt another Vaishnav. But then there's unknowing offence. Sometimes you do something and you don't know it's going to be offensive, but a Vaishnava gets offended by it. Then there's also inadvertent offense. Sometimes you do something and you're not even aware that it has offended a Vaishnava. And then there is also internal offense, just in your mind. Um, you may be thinking of something that is also an offense. In Kali Yuga, you don't get reactions for that, but Vichar, Achar and Prachar, this is where offences reside. So offences reside in the consciousness, in the words, the Prachar and in the Achar, how you deal with someone. So even the offence in the Vichar, it will eventually become Achar and Prachar. There's a reason why so many stories are given and so much emphasis is put on avoiding Vaishnav Aparad. It's not just that we want to make sure we don't hurt a Vaishnav. The idea of so much being talked about in terms of Aparad is to make us very, very sensitive towards other people. 
The basic problem in Kali Yuga is that we have become very, very insensitive towards others. We kind of live in this world, but we are oblivious about how other people are feeling, what other people are going through, and we are very, very uh, self-centered. The whole process of Krishna consciousness is meant to awaken loving relationships. But loving relationships cannot take place unless one is selfless. But until one can become selfless, one cannot become selfless until they first become sensitive. You see, if you think of it as a continuum, there is selfishness, which is where most of us are, there's selflessness, which is where we want to get to, but the midway point is you first have to become sensitive. If we first have to become more aware of other people and what they're feeling. And therefore, so many uh, incidents and stories and accounts of the effects of offenses are given. So many prohibitions. There's Nama Parad, there's Vaishnava Parad, there's Dharma Parad, there's Seva Parad. So many Aparads. My God, it feels like you have to walk around on eggshells. Make sure I don't commit an Aparad. Why so many Aparads? Because it's helping us to become more conscious about how we're conducting ourselves and interacting with Krishna, interacting with others. If all these aparads were not there, if all these stories were not given, then what would happen in our life is we just continue living very, very insensitively towards others. And if we're insensitive, we can never become selfless. And if we're not selfless, we can never experience love. <coughs> Therefore, it's very interesting actually. In the 11th canto, 7th canto of the Bhagavatam, <coughs> it's mentioned w when and why deity worship was introduced. Does anyone know when deity worship was introduced in which yuga? Anyone know? Dwapar yuga? Any other takers? Beginning of Kali Yuga? Any other takers? Actually, Bhagavatam says that deity worship was introduced at the beginning of Treta Yuga. Let me see if I can find the verse here. Um, this is relevant to our discussion, so I see. Okay. okay, yeah, here we go. 7, 14, 39. <coughs> if you want the reference. Drishtva desham mitho nrinam avagnanat matam ripa treta dishu harer archa kriya ekavibhi krita. So this verse is saying that deity worship was introduced at the beginning of Treta Yuga. But now let me ask you the more interesting question. Why do you think deity worship was introduced at the beginning of Treta Yuga? What was the reason for deity worship being introduced? Does anyone know? Yeah? Okay, so after Satya and Treta, consciousness falls down and therefore we need a deity worship to lift our consciousness up. Okay, good. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so you're saying so that we can understand Krishna is a person because Krishna was coming in Dwapra Yuga. Okay, good. Any other reason? Yeah, fair enough. So that we become more personal with the Lord, okay? 
Brian? Say again? To have better dealings between, okay. I mean, is N there? He got the right answer. Are oh, you want to say something also? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So all of these are true, but this is what the Bhagavatam says. Brian was spot on. My dear king, when great sages and saintly persons saw mutually disrespectful dealings at the beginning of Treta Yuga, deity worship in the temple was introduced with all paraphernalia. That's very interesting. The reason why the sages introduced deity worship in the temple was to counteract the disrespectful dealings between the devotees. Because when you do deity worship, there are so many details you have to become conscious of. You have to be on time, you have to be clean, you have to do things in a specific order. You have to, um, you have to pay great attention to detail. And what all of this does when we're worshipping the deities is it's helping us to become more conscious. Because actually, we don't treat Krishna as a person <clears throat> and therefore we also don't treat others as a person. So the idea of deity worship is to become very sensitive, very conscious and then if you're really doing deity worship properly, then the net result should be that you then have wonderful relationships with everyone else because we become more sensitive and we become more um, conscious in how we are carrying ourselves around others. Therefore, what does Bhagavatam say? Who is considered a materialistic devotee? If they worship the Lord in the form of the deity, but they're not able to see that Krishna is within the hearts of all living entities. If you're not able to see that Krishna is in the heart of everyone and therefore treat them with respect, then your worship of the deity is simply on a materialistic level. Because the whole purpose of worshipping Krishna on the altar is so that you can then see Krishna within everyone and then have loving relationships with them in a mood of great sensitivity, selflessness and kindness. So because Sobri Muni had become insensitive and had committed a Vaishnava Parad, then he faced many, many obstacles. Krishna again and again is warning us of Vaishnava Parad, not because he just wants to catch us out and strike us down, but because through Aparad, he's teaching us to become more sensitive. It's very interesting, like why should someone, why should someone get an, a, a reaction for an offense even when they didn't mean to create an offense? That seems unfair, isn't it? If I didn't mean to uh, offend someone, why should I get a reaction for it? But even the fact that you didn't mean to offend them but they got offended means that there's some level of insensitivity within you because we were not conscious of how someone would react to something. Therefore, a devotee is very, very conscious, very, very sensitive. And uh, Krishna gives us all of these accounts to reflect on so that we realize that being insensitive and unconscious in our dealings is not an option for anyone who wants to ultimately achieve real loving relationship. And that is uh, what we're learning from this account of Sobri Muni. Hare Krishna. Hare. Any questions, comments?
or anything anyone would like to uh, clarify? Yes, okay, Karina, and then Govinda. <coughs> Deity worship in Kali Yuga, a prime requirement. Well, we know Shastra is saying, Krite yadhyayato vishnum kretayam yachato mukhe dvapare paricharyayam kalautad harikirtanad. Satya means dhyan, meditation. Treta means yagya, sacrifice. Dvapara means archa, which means deity worship. Kalautad harikirtanad. In Kali Yuga, a holy name is only required. So that we know, kalo nasteva 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 katiranyata. But still, Srila Prabhupada put an emphasis on it. Srila Prabhupada brought the deities. He realized that that purification, that, um, that elevation of culture that comes from deity worship, that refinement of someone's character and consciousness from engaging in archana, then means that we can approach the holy name with some purity and so um, yes we can say it is essential to support the um, the chanting of the holy name of krishna but um, but chanting of the holy name is the primary because even when we do deity worship it begins and ends with the chanting of the holy name but yes, it is required for purification. That was Srila Prabhupada's uh, strategy. But if for some reason one is not able to, or one uh, is in a situation where they're not able to engage regularly in deity worship, still it's said that just by being in the RT and just by taking darshan of the Lord and participating, one becomes part of the deity worship. So... Um, Yes, it's all about becoming personal with Krishna. So, Marshal, from your wonderful class, uh, three points that you mentioned and that was quite striking that you can offend and go to by your vichar, your thought, by your archar, by your behavior, and by your prachar, by your speech. And I'm just like thinking that to listening is really difficult to live, to live life without the end. Because sometimes we speak badly, sometimes we behave badly, we devote it, and sometimes we think also badly. And at the same time, I was thinking, so our emotional practices, aren't they good enough to counteract the offense in these three ways. If we are struggling to be free from offense, just separately, then where is the time even to perform emotional service? Should we be like, okay, let me be careful, you know, I can't, I can't think badly, I can't speak badly? Or should we concentrate more on our emotional practices and automatically then we will also become free from offense? Because according to what I learned when you were speaking, In the Chatu Shloki of the Bhagavatam, there's a very, very, the final verse of the Chatu Shloki is very interesting. It says, one should search for Krishna both directly and indirectly. And the idea is that we search for Krishna directly by anukulyasya uh, sankalpa, by doing all those things favorable to devotional service, for, favorable to Krishna. But we search for Krishna indirectly by pratikulyasya varjanam, giving up those things that are harmful. That is also a way of getting closer to Krishna. So therefore, anartha nivriti and artha pravriti go together, hand in hand. It cannot just be one or the other. We should be maya cautious, but Krishna conscious. 
If you're Krishna conscious but not Maya cautious, you're gonna you're gonna maybe get caught out. But if you're Maya cautious but you forget to become Krishna conscious, then you also you're just running away, but you're not actually developing any love. So both have to go hand in hand. Like Krishna says, Devi here Shaguna Mai, Mama Maya Duratyaya. If you look at that verse, basically in the first two lines, Krishna is saying, be Maya cautious. Devi here, Shaguna Mai, Mama Maya Duratyaya. Krishna is saying, be very aware, Maya is very powerful. Be aware of all the ways in which you're blocking yourself. But then Krishna later on says, Surrender to me, come to me. So Srila Prabhupada also said, the problem of my disciples is that they are not sufficiently scared of Maya. In these days in East Africa, I've been, naturally we've been remembering Tribhuvanath Prabhu as we've been traveling. And one of the last interactions, Tribhuvanath Prabhu had got cancer and he was going to the hospital. And, uh, and so one, he was walking out of the shoe room at the manor and then one devotee said to him, Oh, Tribhuvanathu, are you not scared? He said, the only thing I fear in my life is that I may offend a Vaishnava. That we should be fearful. We should be fearful that we should not cause harm, cause hurt. Of course, when others are hurting us, then we feel, well, so what? They should also feel some hurt. Naturally, we feel like that. But we need to get beyond that. Um, so yes, it's not that we should just run around and be scared of Maya or be scared of committing offenses and not do anything in the process. But we should uh, both have to go hand in hand. Otherwise, uh, we're doing so many things and you know like once I was on book distribution I stopped this, I was in Leicester it's full of Indian Gujaratis <laughs> so I stopped one Indian man and he said oh yeah Bhagavad Gita I know, I know, I know as I, was, as I was trying to inspire him then finally I put the Gita in his hand and he, uh, so I said no, no, you take, take for your family then he goes, no, okay I'll take so I said, yeah, people give a donation also. <laughs> he said, no, no, I don't give, I'm not giving a donation. I'll take it if you want to, I'm not giving a donation. Anyway, then he came back, then he came back later in the day, he said, he just came randomly to me and he said, I have found the sure way to become rich. So I said, okay, you want to give a donation? He said, no, no, I don't. But he said, but I can tell you. I can tell you how you become rich. And he said, some people think to become rich you have to earn lots of money. But they don't know the secret that to become rich, just make sure you don't spend any money. <laughs> then I realized, now I understand his worldview, no donation. But then when he was walking away, I was thinking, maybe it's like that for us. That actually every day we're doing so many powerful activities in Krishna consciousness, so much tapasya, so much absorption in pancha anga bhakti, we should be rich. Why are we not more advanced? Why haven't we become uh, closer to Krishna? Why are the tadasma um, sadam, ridayam batedam, why are the hairs not standing on end? Why are the tears not falling? Why is the body not shivering? Because Bhagavatam says the heart has become steel framed through many offenses. So he was right. The way you get rich is it's not necessarily about doing something extraordinary. What we're already doing is extraordinary. But the problem is we're losing. We're losing mercy. We're losing the effects through insensitivity, inattention, impulsiveness, uh, inattention in how we deal with others. So it's very, very... Uh, in Chaitanya Bhagavat, Vrindavan Das Thakur says, he says, Sune Sarva Lok, the whole world, I want you to know, it's very easy to get Krishna praying. 
Just chant Krishna's names and don't offend the Vaishnava. Very easy. Simple, but not easy. <laughs> so we have to do both. Otherwise, if we don't become sensitive to the devotees, how we will become sensitive to Krishna? Inside they are? Okay, so outside they Oh, outside they deal nicely they with you. Oh, okay. Inside, have this anger against their mother. We have to train ourselves to uh, not be offended. Actually, even now, one uh, author in the material world, he wrote a book called Unoffendable. How to become unoffendable. Actually, Vaishnav life means we can understand our advancement by how unoffendable we become. Srila Prabhupada writes in the Krishna book, one, one's greatness is measured by their ability to tolerate provoking situations. You can understand how much you've advanced as a Vaishnav by how unoffendable you've become. Because as we grow in our spiritual life, we realize I committed so many aparads. Aparada sahasrani kriyante harnishamaya we realize from morning to evening I have been offensive. Therefore, we need shama. We need forgiveness. It said that Haridas Thakur, he, he was forgiving people before they even committed an offense. They were, he never got to that point of even being offended. It was like just like, how do we get there? So we have to realize, we have to go through this. They are sending me lessons. It's my karma. I have to improve. It's hard, but we have to become unoffendable. There's no science. We just have to pray to Krishna. That may I realize uh, whatever is coming to me, I need to go through this. The world is fair, even when it feels unfair. Is that okay? Yeah, I'll open it up a little. Okay. I don't know. Hi, just tell me when you should. I think at the back. Don't take those last two. Okay.
Goswami says, Ihayasya harer dasya karmana manasa gira nikhala shvebhya vasta su jivan mukta sa uchate. Vaishnav means karmana manasa gira, their words, activities, <coughs> their thoughts are all for the pleasure of the Lord. So to impede a Vaishnav means to impede the words, activities and desires of a Vaishnav. And if a Vaishnav's words, activities and desires are also for the pleasure of the Lord, then to impede the Vaishnav also means to impede the pleasure of the Lord. So if you impede the Vaishnav, and also if you don't help the Vaishnav, then you are also directly having a bearing on Krishna's pleasure, because Krishna is pleased by those things. Therefore, yes, to impede a Vaishnav means either to actively stop or to make it difficult or it can also mean to not support all of those things can be classed as impeding a Vaishnav to actively stop them to make it difficult for them and also sometimes to not support them if we do this we must be very aware. Srila Prabhupada said, my God brothers, so many are saying, this has not been done, that has not been done. But what have they done to spread the Krishna consciousness movement? So he was strong. Because he experienced this. He experienced that some people were stopping his preaching actively. He experienced that some were making it very difficult for him to preach. And he also experienced that some were just not participating he invited everyone come all of these can be classed in some level as impeding a Vaishnav so when a Vaishnav is trying to do something nice when a Vaishnav is trying to do some sincere service for Krishna we must step forward even if we have limited capacity the very least we can do is offer some encouraging words even if I can't help the other Vaishnav in what they're doing, at least I can offer some encouraging words that goes a long way. If we create a society in which no Vaishnav is impeding no other Vaishnav, our movement will grow like anything. But subconsciously, sometimes unconsciously, we are impeding each other's activities. And it's not pleasing to Krishna because it's service to Krishna that's being impeded. Is that okay? Okay, last two questions. I just quickly answer and then try to. In, in, in Sanskrit literature, we have two things, pāp, pāp which means sin, and aparad which means offence. The basic difference between pāp and aparad is sin means to do something without Krishna. Aparad means to do something against Krishna. When you do a sinful activity, what we're doing is we're not including Krishna in the picture. Like for example, Krishna says in Gita, Yagya Shishta Shina Shanto Muchante Sarvakilbishe Bunjante Te Dvadam Papam Yepachan Tiatmakaranat. If you eat, but you don't offer it to Krishna, then it becomes Papam. Become you verily eat only sin because you're eating but you're not including Krishna. But aparad means away from Radharani, away from Krishna. In other words, doing something actively against Krishna. Therefore, aparad is much more uh, dangerous than even sin. Because uh, sin can be counteracted by prayaschita, atonement. But aparad, even Krishna won't. Uh, get rid of it by atonement, you need to get forgiveness from the person. So yes, 
Aparad means against, doing something against Krishna. Okay, last question. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Maharaj, in the court of the law, the church is not a party, it's not a crime. What is not a crime? What is not a crime? Defense in the court of the law is not a crime. What if, for example, in the system of the one and punishment, it creates to escape peace, creates prosperity in the society. What if you contract an offense in the offense? That in this case will create yeah, thank you for raising that point. So what if someone is offending us and we defend ourselves? Uh, that seems to be also part of a progressive civilization that you can't just let keep people keep offending you. But it's not that we have to create another offense to counteract an offense. In English they say two wrongs don't make a right. So this is what we see. For example, in the sacrifice of Daksha, there was a curse and then there was a counter curse and then there was another curse. And this is basically just escalates the ego. So therefore we have to counteract an uh, offense in a different way. We have to ensure there is protection of ourselves. We have to ensure there is feedback given to that person. We have to ensure that everyone else doesn't have to be subjected to such things. But it's not that we have to become offensive in order to do those things. Because otherwise you just become another dog in the fight. You have allowed someone else's maya to become your maya. Therefore, we should not do that. We should try to uh, raise the bar and um, try to con counteract offense through saintliness. Saintliness doesn't mean passiveness. Saintliness means you also may actively do something, but in your uh, conduct, you maintain the highest principles of integrity. If we do that, then we will create real communities, you know. Otherwise, there will just be more fighting, more animosity, more division, and more offense. And in a community where there's more offense, then the mercy of Krishna is lost. But what did the Lord say to the Prachetas? You have my mercy. Not because you did so many years of austerity, but because you lovingly lived together for 10,000 years with a great spirit of friendship amongst yourselves, therefore all my blessings are with you. So let us do that. When we're hearing about offenses, let us rather see that this, all this talk of offenses is helping us to become more conscious so that we can create a society of friendship because a society of friendship will attract Krishna's blessings and everything will work. And that is the purpose of the Krishna Consciousness Movement.